I might uh, get us started properly, I think, um, although I know other people will be joining us. Um, so hello, everyone, and uh, a very good afternoon from a very sunny North London. Uh, good morning, afternoon or evening to you, wherever you may be and whatever the weather may be like. Uh, welcome to the fifth Tick Tech Civic Tech Surgery, organised by my society and supported by the National Endowment for Democracy. Today's event focuses on learning from climate action. How can civic tech drive impactful societal change? I'm Gavin Freegard, a freelance consultant working with my society on the Tech Tech Labs program. Among other things, I'm also an associate at the Institute for Government Think Tank and a special advisor at the Open Data Institute here in the UK. And I'm your chair facilitator and host for today's event. Uh, do tell us who you are and why you're here in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, it's wonderful to have you all with us. Over the next couple of hours, we're going to discuss some of the opportunities, challenges and dilemmas we face as a global civic tech community when it comes to climate action. My society has started doing a lot more work in this area over the last few years. In fact, uh, in September, we'll be holding another event showcasing projects that are using data and digital technology to tackle climate change at a local level. We're looking for speakers for that. Uh, details will appear in the chat at some point if you'd like to get involved. But as for today's event, uh, for these first 10 minutes or so, I'm going to outline how it's all going to work and give you a bit more background on what we're hoping to achieve with the Tech Tech Labs programme, of which this event is a part. We'll explore some questions about civic tech and climate action with the help of some fantastic speakers and with all of you having the chance to share your thoughts as well. And then we'll think about what might help solve some of the challenges that we've surfaced with a view to commissioning a solution. Some quick housekeeping first. Today's event is on the record. It's being recorded and will be published online afterwards, along with minutes of today's event. You should be able to access a live transcript here on Zoom. Please let us know in the chat if you can't. You're very welcome to share details of the event on social media, should it be working. I understand that certain uh, websites might uh, currently be down. Uh, it's hashtag TikTok uh, if they are up and running again. And if you'd like to contribute to today's discussion, you can use the chat here on Zoom, and you can use the Padlet board that you'll soon get a link to if you've not had it already. If you've not used Padlet before, you'll see it has the questions we're going to discuss and space for you to add your thoughts and comments by clicking on the plus signs. Feel free to populate that throughout the event. There'll also be a few opportunities later to unmute your mic and tell us what you're thinking as well. Now, for a quick introduction to the Tic Tac Labs programme, which is run by my society with support from the National Endowment for Democracy, the aim is to discuss and tackle some of the biggest challenges facing the global civic tech and digital democracy sector. We want to grow the civic tech evidence base, address some key issues, and enhance the effectiveness and potential impact of civic tech projects. Tic Tech, which stands for the Impact of Civic Technology Conference, started as an annual global in-person conference in 2015. We hope there'll be another in-person event in the future, but in the meantime, we've converted it into this year-round Tic Tech Labs programme. Our steering group, you can see them on the right, identified six big challenges common to civic tech around the world. You can see those on the left. As well as today's subject, climate action, we've so far covered subjects including accessibility, quality information and storytelling, and we have one more event in September on civic tech in hostile environments. For each of those six topics, we have organised or will organise a civic tech surgery, like today's, to delve further into some common challenges and possible solutions. After each surgery, there'll be an action lab, a small working group of around six people, will commission a piece of work to help solve one of the challenges that we raise. If you're interested in getting involved in that, we'll tell you how to do so at the end of today's event. So by the end of the programme in 2023, we hope we'll have six pieces of commissioned work, as well as increased connections and learning across the global civic tech community. This is our fifth civic tech surgery. We've commissioned some work on public-private partnerships from the first one and accessibility and inclusivity from the second. We currently have a live call for proposals for developing resources around accessing quality information on our website from the third. And our fourth action lab on storytelling and reach will be meeting in the next few weeks. You can find much more information on all of that on the Tic Tech Labs website. So today we are focusing on civic tech and climate action, and in particular, this big overarching question. How can civic tech enable people to coordinate action so that it's greater than the sum of its parts? So how can we build something bigger than individual interventions? 
Underneath that big question, our objectives for today are to discuss the opportunities and challenges in using civic tech to encourage people to change their behaviour to help combat climate change and its effects, to think about possible solutions to the challenges that we raise, and last, but definitely not least, to explore how the Tick Tech Action Lab that will come together after this surgery can help address one of the common challenges by commissioning a relevant piece of work. This is how we're going to do that. First, we'll go to our excellent speakers, who I'll introduce shortly, and begin with the opportunities, specifically asking them about the projects they've been working on. There'll then be some time for all of you joining us to do some silent working on the Padlet board and tell us what you've been working on as well. We'll then ask our speakers to reflect on that, and there may be a chance to unmute your microphone during that bit. We'll then follow the same format, going to our speakers, then some silent Padlet working, then some reflections, when looking at what challenges we have seen or experienced when it comes to driving impactful change using civic technology. We'll then do the same thing again, speakers, Padlet, reflection, for thinking about how we or others have tried to tackle those challenges and dilemmas. And then we'll move on to the final part of today's event. We have up to $3,760 to commission a solution to some of the challenges we've identified. So we'll be thinking about work, what work it could be useful to commission. Again, we'll start with some silent work on the Padlet board and then get into discussion. And at the very end, I'll tell you how you can get involved in the Action Lab that will decide what commission that builds on all of those ideas. That's very nearly it from me. Uh, it's now time to introduce our brilliant speakers who are going to share their experiences and uh, kickstart our discussions today. You can hopefully see pictures of them on your screen now. Uh, they are Laura Brown, the Chief Marketing Officer of IC Change, a climate platform that's enabling individuals to take action against climate change. After 12 years working on strategy for some of the world's biggest publishers, such as Lonely Planet, Politico and The Economist, Laura committed to shifting her work towards fighting climate change after a tornado hit her neighbourhood in East Nashville just before the pandemic lockdowns. We also have Jacopo Ottaviani, an award-winning computer scientist and data scientist who manages Code for Africa's data portfolio, including its Data Academy, as Chief Data Officer. His data journalism projects have been published by Thomson Reuters Foundation, De Spiegel, El Pais, Al Jazeera and Internazionale, among others, and include a drone mapping and water sensors project in Nigeria, which won the Sigma Award, and the lungs of the earth immersive journey across the rainforests of the world. And we also have Lawrence Watson, head of technology at SUBAC, an accelerator that helps find, fund and scale organisations and individuals who are saving the planet. He's been at the intersection of climate tech and policy for 10 years, co-founding data science consultancy Future Energy Associates and working at Carbon Tracker, Ember and the UK Parliament. We're very grateful to all of them, as well as to all of you for joining us for, for joining us for the discussion today. So hopefully that all makes sense. If you've got any questions at any point, uh, please pop them in the chat. If you've got any thoughts as we go, uh, do share them in the chat as well or under the appropriate question on the Padlet board. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So hello to all of you. Um, so we're going to embark on the first section of today's event, uh, which is going to be starting with our uh, speakers and asking them the question, what civic tech climate action projects are you working on or have you worked on? Uh, that relates to column one of the Padlet, for those of you that have that, has that open. And I'll ask each of our speakers to share their thoughts for around five minutes each. Then we'll have five minutes of silent working to add ideas to the Padlet. Uh, also the chat, and then we'll have a further five minutes or so to reflect and discuss. So what sort of tech climate action projects are you working on or have you worked on? I'll uh, go to Laura uh, for our first contribution. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. So I'm Laura. I work with IC Change. We're a platform based in the United States that's connecting cities and residents on climate impacts. Um, cities, engineers, and utilities use our software to connect with their communities, validate climate models, and build infrastructure. Um, IC Change is helping to develop a climate response plan that is in the right places, designed to the right sizes, and built for the right reasons. Um, and please ignore the two cats that will uh, pop into the screen at various times. Um, it's unstoppable. I can't do anything about it. Okay. So decisions that we make in the next five years are going to impact everyone for the next 50 years. Um, we're in this really crucial time where decisions need to be made on how and where to make these large investments for cities to increase their resiliency and their response to climate change. Um, some things that I see changes doing in Miami, um, in South Florida, the city is 
um, fighting really hard against sea level rise, the city like slowly kind of falling into the sea, flood events are increasing every year. Um, we are working directly with the city to deploy before and during flood events so that residents are able to report storm drains that have been clogged or um, flooding in particular areas so that the city is able to deploy resources. Um, we're also working with the Ocean Conservancy to help residents report pollution. Um, a thing that happens when cities flood is all of the pollution that, or I'm sorry, all of the litter that accumulates on the side of the road. Um, it floods, it flows out to the ocean, that causes a whole bunch of different issues. So we're working on several different fronts in Miami. In New Orleans, um, which is in Louisiana, again, another city that's really, really susceptible to flooding and sea level rise. Um, we're working with local community organizations and NGOs to make sure that the city has the resources it needs to deploy in more low income neighborhoods. We've helped um, generate over $25 million in storm infrastructure to low income neighborhoods that would have not necessarily gotten it um, otherwise. So we're, we're really focused on helping cities communicate with their residents on climate impacts that are on a daily basis during major storm events impacting their lives. And we are helping to make sure that the cities have the information and the data they need to distribute the funds that they're getting in a more equitable manner and in a way that is um, uh, enhancing community trust around the issue. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Plenty, plenty of you to be getting on with there. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, let's go to Jacopo next. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jacopo here from Italy. Uh, thanks for introducing me. I think you were very nice to me with your words. Uh, I'm a computer scientist uh, who works at Code for Africa. So I'm one of the few Europeans working in this non-profit organization based in uh, South Africa. And uh, I work specifically on data journalism initiatives. Uh, we focus on uh, training and mentoring and uh, making grants for journalists from uh, several African countries, uh, most, more specifically uh, we're working on uh, an initiative called the Lungs of the Earth, which wants to aims to train and mentor Central African journalists. So uh, uh, journalists who are based in the Congo Basin uh, uh, region uh, that includes uh, Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, Cameroon, uh, also DRC, and a few other countries uh, uh, where there is a very, very large rainforest, uh, one of the three largest rainforests in the world, and which is unfortunately quite underreported on the news, uh, but it's facing uh, issues like deforestation and other climate change related issues, uh, wildfires, um, you know, environmental exploitation, uh, extractive industries, illegal mining, and many other problems affect the Congo Basin. So Code for Africa, uh, set an objective that is uh, let's use data and satellite images to report on uh, illegal deforestation in Central Africa, but let's do it in cooperation with local journalists. So how to do that? Uh, we have uh, three, uh, three kind of main ingredients in our recipe, which is basically uh, trainings, data journalism trainings, uh, how to clean data, how to visualize data, how to include data into journalism stories, specifically on climate change and deforestation. Uh, second, we offer one-on-one uh, one -on -one mentorship sessions for journalists who want to improve their methodology uh, using, for example, research data, academic data. So we connect journalists with researchers from universities globally um, and who can kind of learn uh, the scientific aspect of the issues that affect their daily lives or their communities. And number three, we make grants. So we offer financial support uh, for journalists who want to uh, spend a few months on a story, but uh, don't have the means to do that. Uh, 
for any reason. So Lungs of the Earth uh, is still ongoing. Uh, we created the first iteration of stories uh, in uh, between 2020 and 2021. And I'm gonna share a list of stories that kind of emerged from this uh, project. Um, the journalists all work with local newspapers, radio stations, TV stations. So basically they raise awareness around climate change uh, within their communities, um, but they also publish online. So people from everywhere can read their stories. And it's very interesting to read these stories from an African perspective, rather than the usual stories that we can read, for example, on European media or the BBC, the CNN and the uh, all the media we know very well. It's super interesting to see how this problem is perceived by uh, African journalists and give them the tools to kind of improve their methodologies and to use data. Um, maybe it's worth mentioning the main uh, supporters of this initiative. Uh, one is Global Forest Watch, which is an online database made by the World Resources Institute it's online, so if you Google Global Forest Watch, you can actually explore uh, on an interactive map deforestation in real time, and also wildfires in real time or near real time. And uh, we wanted these journalists to use this database to tell new stories and connect the, uh, the data with human stories. That, that was another uh, sub-objective of our project. So, it's very interesting to read the data, but it's also interesting to meet the human beings who are affected by the issues that are represented by the data. So the only way or one of the few ways to do this is to work with local journalists who can meet with real human beings in their countries. And I think I have five, five seconds left. I see the timer there, uh, but we can, we can continue chatting about it. I'll drop the link. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you, Jacopo. Again, a huge amount of work and also really interesting the different approaches that you and Laura have talked about, uh, Pacific Tech being able to do something about all of this. Uh, Lawrence, it's your turn to uh, brave the five minute timer. Thanks, Gavin. Hi, everyone. Yeah, very pleased to be here. Um, I think I've worked for about four four different not-for-profit groups focused around different climate issues um, and sort of mostly with a sort of data and tech and tool building hat on. Um, and that's my role at, at SUBAC, which is an accelerator for not-for-profit organizations that are mostly sort of data and technology driven. And the idea with SUBAC is to learn from what's happened in the sort of startup world about sort of massive growth and how that happens within organizations. And then obviously what we want to see is, is huge climate impact. So we don't necessarily want to see huge revenue growth, but we do want organizations to set out to have ambitious goals and then to work out what they need to, to do to get there. So the, the program that we run, we were on our second cohort. We've had 11 organizations go through it. Uh, we try and skill them up and, and raise their sort of capability levels and give them the coaching or help they need across a range of different issues from use of data and technology to, to building products to sort of having their house in order from an organizational point of view. Um, we also have an individuals program for fellows where people can apply for a 10,000 pound grant to work on open climate data projects that we hope will sort of augment this. Um, and we are also looking to think about where there are sort of systemic issues in the space. And we started by saying we think data is maybe poorly used. There's a lot of duplication of efforts. There isn't a huge embrace of openness and the sort of open source that's worked so well in the private sector. There's a lot of people sort of feeling very protective about their data. And so we really wanted to sort of see if we could start a cultural shift uh, about that. So we started by building a, a data portal, uh, a traditional data portal called the Climate Data Catalog. And we have various other ideas about how to improve sort of service design and have that be the thin end of a wedge that, that allows organizations to open up. But it's also about how innovators and, and change makers, which can include like uh, anybody, you know, any citizen, how they find the right data and how they answer the questions that's relevant to them. So it's a curated portal. We want to say what are people need uh, to answer the questions and to have an impact and then to try and ensure that their needs are being met or they they have a mechanism to find the answers that they, they need. So that's Subak. And I'll just very quickly mention two other projects that I've worked on because I, I think they have different lessons for, the, for this whole talk. Um, going backwards in time, one was called SCORE, the European Parliament, which was around helping citizens choose who to vote for for MEPs. And there isn't a huge amount of coverage about MEPs and there's a huge amount of votes. So we wanted to say, how is an ordinary citizen meant to know who they should pick? 
So it, the idea was that we would highlight specific votes chosen by experts and then present that in a, in a dashboard for people. Um, so I'll drop the links in a second. So that was kind of an interesting, a different, different one. And then going even further back, um, Louise Crow is on the call, who's chief executive of my society, but she used to be the developer with an org called Sandbag. And I then uh, took over from her as she went back to my society. Uh, and Sandbag had, did a lot of things, but it was trying to reform the European carbon market. And they had built a system whereby any individual could buy a carbon permit and retire it and sort of cancel a ton of carbon that would otherwise have been uh, emitted by, you know, a European steel uh, plant. And there was various reasons why that was complicated, but it would also be symbolic because we would also campaign and ask for a change. So we'd say, look, you know, all these people have have cancelled one ton, you know, can't you as European policymakers also do your bit and reform the entire system? Um, let me just pop those in. So yeah, the, the score EP website is, is still there, but it's a bit of an artifact because it's it's not updated. And the sandbag cancelled permits has is now uh, no longer exists and that organization has moved on. But it's sort of interesting to see it come back around with this huge amount of discussion around voluntary carbon markets and carbon offsets. And that there is this huge appetite for people to find ways where they can turn money into you know carbon reductions. And of course the the premise is so attractive, it's so easy that anyone, you know, whatever company or individual, you can just spend some money and you will have a, an impact. And it's a nice concept, of course, there's a huge amount of subtlety and nuance and a whole industry developing about how we measure and verify and sort of educate and make people care, uh, you know, at the sort of point of purchase. Um, but as I said, the climate data catalogue is my main thing at the moment. So very keen to get feedback. And so, you know, uh, thanks for your feedback as well. So I know some of you have already looked at this. Um, but I'll I'll stop there for now. Brilliant, thank you, Lawrence. Again, <clears throat> huge diversity in the different approaches, uh, civic tech approaches to, to tackling some of these problems. Um, what we're going to do now is give you around three minutes of silent working on the Padlet, particularly the first column. So you've got an opportunity to tell us about some of the projects you're involved in. There are some really interesting ones up there already from people on this call and who couldn't make this call today. Um, after those three minutes, I'll then go back to our speakers for some reflections um, on what they've heard and what else they've seen. Again, feel free to put some questions in the chat if you'd like to, and um, if you'd like to sort of come in and unmute your mic uh, in that section as well, once we've worked on the Padlet, uh, do say so in the chat as well. Great to hear from you and some of the other things that you're doing. Uh, but we're going to start with that three minutes of silent working, I say, so, and time's up. So if we look at the Padlet, uh, we've got uh, some work from my society on uh, prototyping what to work on next. Uh, we've got Climate Watch uh, from Germany. We've got uh, the CBAC Climate Data Catalog, which we've heard about already. We've got the Climate Action Plans Explorer, which is Climate Emergency UK and my society, helping you to find what local councils uh, are doing. Uh, we've then got Vocalize, uh, who are a platform uh, sort of organising ideas and uh, being able to crowdsource those and even manage participatory budgets to fund them. Um, we've got Productive Online Democratic Discourse from NCIV. Uh, we've got an eco event in the box, so crowdsource tips and ideas if you want to run an event locally. And we've got the Cambridge Carbon Map, which is in development, uh, combining emissions disclosure by local organisations and their sustainability initiatives to inspire and inform their peers and encourage collaboration. Excellent. So again, quite a, a sort of broad sweep. Of, uh, of different approaches there. Um, I'm going to go back to our speakers uh, shortly. I'll go in the order, uh, Laura, Jacopo, and then Lawrence, uh, to reflect on what they've seen and anything else that they've uh, sort of thought about in the interim. Again, if you've got any questions for them or if you would like to come off mute and tell us a bit more about what you're working on, uh, please do um, say in the chat or use the raise hand tool and uh, I'll bring you in as well. Um, so, Laura, yeah, what, uh, what do you think about everything we've, uh, we've heard so far and seen on the Padlet? Yeah, I think this is great. Um, it seems like there are quite a lot of people working on this challenge sort of broadly. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to continue this conversation and see what solutions everyone can come up with. Excellent. Uh, Jacopo, how about you? Uh, I'm, I'm really loving the list. Uh, I feel like some of these tools or approaches can be uh, replicated in, uh, in the global south, for example, in Africa, but not only, also in Southeast Asia, for example, or in Latin America. So I think that's the power of civic tech, especially when it's open source. So I see, for example, uh, Productive Online Democratic Discourse is an open source software 
which could be definitely useful in, in some of the links I work in. Um, yeah, loving these links. Excellent. And uh, if people think of others uh, during the course of the event, uh, do feel free to keep adding them uh, to the Padlet as well. Uh, Lawrence, how about you? Yeah, I'm. I mean, really, really awesome projects. I'm struck by that the, there's a very strong like place-based theme, um, which I think is like which I've heard from various other groups, sort of environmental groups, creating tools for climate action. I think Friends of the Earth has a really nice one in the UK about local action. And I guess I've always come from like a a sort of policy wonk, sort of top-down kind of thing about saying, you know, what about system change and how do we change policies? And so, I what it makes me wonder is how do we do maybe they shouldn't be joined but like we have these local level you know which is so meaningful which are very validating for people they can see a tangible impact they can see a problem they can work with their communities um and then we have this you know okay we need to vote for someone or we need to change a policy at a high level like should we try and connect these things is it better to have them divorced and have different people focus on it in really interested to sort of hear how people think those two things should fit together Brilliant. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, joining us today wants to come in on that or has anything else they'd like to say. Louise, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on that. My instinct is yes, we've got to connect the two. I think it's still an open problem how to do that. And Laura, you, you may have thoughts coming very much from that local world, but I think, Lawrence, I agree with everything you say about the tangibleness as life gets more complex these are complex wicked problems in your local area it starts to feel very crunchy very real you might even know the local politicians you can certainly talk about very concrete projects but i think in the uk and i suspect elsewhere the big levers still belong to a higher level of government and so you've got to kind of I don't think we have any solutions, but I think that is one of the big problems to chip away at as a kind of a, a loose group of organisations who are really interested in making significant change. Thanks, Louise. Um, does anyone else have any views on, on that particular question or indeed anything uh, to do with the sort of projects that you're working on or you've heard other people talk about already? Uh, feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand tool, that should be down the bottom of your screen or uh, say in the chat that you'd like to come in with uh, we've got anything to add. Uh, David Newman has uh, made a very good point in the chat, which is obviously we have a, we essentially have a contest at the moment to be the next Prime Minister of the uh, the UK uh, here in the Conservative Party in Britain. Um, so some way of connecting with those candidates and uh, setting them examinations on what they would do around climate change and net zero. Hopefully um, Tory party members and our media will try and push them towards some of that. Excellent. Uh, so I think it, let's move on to the next section and the next questions. We've looked at what everyone's doing and I suppose some of the opportunities um, around civic tech and climate action. Our next question is what challenges do you see or what challenges have you already experienced when it comes to driving impactful change using civic technology? Again, I'm going to go to our speakers first. We'll have a bit of silent work and then we'll have a bit of discussion. Um, so this time, the challenges that we've seen or experienced, uh, I'm going to go first to Jacopo. Oh, fantastic. OK, I was already kind of thinking of, you know, mm. how to summarize all the challenges that we had during our project. And mm. I think uh, we had to deal with a number of problems. Uh, first off, uh, very concrete problems, like for example, poor connectivity in certain areas in Central Africa. So uh, the journalists we were working with had uh, uh, issues with their internet and access to the resources and webinars and online training sessions that we wanted to, uh, to run. So we came up with a solution, which is basically uh, WhatsApp-based uh, training sessions. Uh, which makes it possible because you can kind of uh, send asynchronous material, learning material so, uh, on WhatsApp. Um, it can be a short video with a kind of um, showcase session on how to use a data visualization tool, for example. Uh, it, it can be a list of uh, resources that can be explored whenever they have access to the internet, but we need to we need to kind of keep in mind that some of our 
beneficiaries and partners are based in areas where the internet is still not uh, very strong. Uh, number two, uh, do you want me to list all the challenges now or you want to kind of rotate? Uh, uh, go, go, go for it, it's pretty interesting. To, I'll go, to it. yeah, okay. Yeah, the next one I have in mind is uh, financial uh, stability of newsrooms in Central Africa. Um, some of these radio stations or uh, newspapers or TV stations have real problems in terms of business model and financial sustainability. So uh, I, I feel like we haven't really solved this really complex problem, but I feel like uh, it would be super useful to brainstorm and work together with the partners on their business models to make them more sustainable so they don't rely only on grants. I think grants can be very useful, but um, I think they should also come up with uh, diversified revenue streams to make their work more sustainable. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I think uh, that mm, sort of uh, the diversity of our pool of journalists made our trainings more challenging uh, because some journalists had a little bit of data literacy, others didn't. Uh, so we had to come up with different kind of levels of complexity in our trainings. And sometimes very basic data literacy trainings can be super useful in, uh, in certain communities where they've never used Excel, for example, before. Um, so yeah, we need to tailor the training programs obviously uh, on the basis of the uh, kind of level of literacy of the beneficiaries. Uh, and it's very difficult to do that transnationally because every single country uh, we worked in is a different world. And there is not just one way to do it. So yeah, sometimes we need to kind of control our ambition as well and not to be over ambitious. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, it feels like um, a lot of those issues have come up with various other civic tech surgeries as well in terms of that sort of access to internet, um, how sort of business models work and the skills. Um, and again, to what extent you can replicate uh, as much as work with, you know, there's a lot of keenness for open source rightly, to what extent you, you do need to tailor things to particular settings as well. So that's a brilliant uh, set of points to kick us off with. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence, how about, oh, actually Lawrence may have just temporarily gone away from his, no, he is back, excellent. Should we come to you next, Lawrence, in terms of the challenges that you've faced? Sorry, Kevin. Just uh, heard the door going. Um, yeah, I mean, the, one of the one of the key ones that we grappled with from hearing from our community was around data and data sets and how one asks questions and sort of grappling with the idea that there is a vast amount of stuff out there, but a lot of it is is behind paywalls or is sort of expensive. And when people are trying to explore potential solutions and then just saying, okay, well, you know. What's the sort of fundamentals here? Like, what's the what's the truth? Or you know, where are the renewables in the in the UK? What's the transmission grid looks like? All this sort of base level stuff. How do you help people get to the solution, and especially around cross domain? So, again, this is sort of interesting in the for profit versus the campaigning space versus again like academia or in government. People within a domain know where to look, but they don't necessarily know how to access it when it's sort of in a in a in a group that isn't isn't close to them. Um, and then there's also again this sort of expert knowledge that um, even when you get some data or you get some stuff you know it might be really difficult to then make sense of it and to really understand you know how to use it properly or how to connect it or maybe there's lots of specific jargon and the best way normally is to find someone you know who is an expert and say right you know could you give me a running start here and give me an hour but if you don't have that connection um, what do you do and I think that's there's even more start probably on the I'm thinking mainly around you know sort of professionals working in sort of campaigning organizations again it's sort of the same again for smaller like community energy groups or even you know just for this general public again how are you able to sort of disentangle all the things you need to know to make a decision and again i'm sort of i, I really like the my society's climate action plan stuff which again just just brings the data out and just says here's the data you know and then i think the challenge is okay well what how should you respond to that data you say my local council is not doing very well so i should go and write to my councillor and say what, you know, say, please do better. How can we, you know, what, what's the next step there? And, you know, obviously if they have a professional campaigner, then they'll, they'll probably have some suggestions. And it's kind of, if you just sort of dump someone in and give recommendations, like I really like that with the Climate Action Plan Explorer, it's, um, it just sort of presents stuff. You know, it's, it's fairly sort of factual, 
because I think when you're presented with a load of just recommendations, it's sort of disempowering because then you're you're taking all the agency away from any kind of community and the, and the place-based stuff. You're just saying, right, you know, we've got the answer, um, which is one, yeah, not only like disempowering, but also not necessarily the right thing because there is a huge amount of local context. So it doesn't, it's not even the best, the best recommendation. So that's something I'm 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 definitely really interested in, like how you can how you can sort of blend those two those two angles. Brilliant, thank you. So again, a, a, a long-standing theme about the availability of data, but also how you how you bring the domain knowledge to it and help people do something. Uh, and a sort of call for action, a call for action that comes out of it. Thank you. Um, so let's go to Laura. Next. Sure. I'll turn off you. Great. Um, I have a list of kind of broad challenges, um, and some of these are, are focused to the United States, um, which has a very unique um, situation, I would say, at the moment, um, but I think is, is sort of relevant to this conversation. So the, the first real challenge is just general trust in government. Um, Americans, in particular, are really mistrustful of our government, and the higher into the government you go, the more distrust there is. Um, but politics and climate change are local. Local impacts are an easy way for people to see how climate change is going to impact them. They're an easy way for people to get involved with climate impacts, particularly in places like New Orleans that have this long history of an inequitable distribution of resources. People kind of have this general vibe of exasperation. They've seen money come in and be distributed inequitably and just have this frustrating experience with, with the government time and time again. Um, working with NGOs and local groups is often really time consuming and you see a lot of infighting over resources and it's really hard to coordinate people and groups when they're feeling so competitive over like limited amounts of resources. Um, but trust is really, really important here. Study after study after study has shown that mutual trust between a government and its citizens is really, really crucial to building healthy communities and actually solving problems. Um, Second, and, and again, another piece of this is equity in climate investment. Um, the United States just passed about a trillion dollars in infrastructure investment. A huge chunk of that is intended to go towards climate resiliency. Um, and our, our current government is focused on distributing that money more equitably so that it goes to communities that need it. Um, but that's only just way easier said than done, particularly with really ingrained procurement processes that um, have been in place for a long time but have not necessarily um, been focused on equity when distributing money. And so that's that's a huge challenge, I think, for companies that are seeking grant money and for the government that's distributing it. Um, the third major challenge is just people have really short attention spans. Um, it makes it really hard to communicate and engage people on issues like climate that have a really long-term horizon. Um, people love instant gratification. Climate change is a long-term problem that is very slowly creeping up on us um, and has long-term solutions that will need to slowly be implemented and, and slowly have a fix. Um, and that's not just on like the layperson and how they impact climate. This is the business community too. Business investment, venture capital firms, other types of startup investment aren't really calibrated for long-term projects that have long-term runways and time horizons. Um, you know, it takes up to two years to run through a procurement process for a city. Um, that's a hard sell to a venture capital firm or, or some sort of other investment that wants profitability much, much quicker, right? And so figuring out a way for us to have these long scale investments in, in businesses that have um, a longer term sales cycle, I think is also really crucial. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, and then next is like communication strat strategy around climate, just kind of generally speaking. Um, I, I've met a lot of engineers and a lot of really cool entrepreneurs working on this problem who get really into the weeds on technical details, but don't have a great sense of how to sort of take a step back and, and broadly communicate those things to the people that it impacts in the communities that they're talking to. Um, 
So figuring out how to engage on sort of a more personal level with people, all of these really cool tech solutions that, that people and businesses are coming up with around this problem, um, I, think is, I think is really crucial. Thanks, Laura. Some really valuable points then. I can see in the chat that they're resonating as well, that uh, point about attention spans and timelines uh, in particular, but also that, that sort of point about the role of experts. Tony in the chat is sort of saying that expert contributions can sometimes create non-optimal solutions. So how can you coordinate them properly? And as you say, um, how do you then take that step back to be able to communicate uh, properly, which is its, its own challenge? So lots of us, lots of things for us to think about there. Um, we're now going to give you three minutes of silent working on the Padlet again. Uh, so this is on the second column, uh, the question about the challenges uh, and difficulties that you may have faced uh, in this field. Um, three minutes to fill that in. And then again, we'll go back to our panel and to all of you for any further reflections and discussion on that. So three minutes uh, on the Padlet, second column, uh, challenges that you've faced. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. And again, looking through the uh, Padlet, I can see some common themes coming through. Um, so we start with somebody saying the complexity of federal administration, which they think may be a German speciality, um, with people trying to shift responsibility to other levels. I, I suspect that's a problem elsewhere as well. And um, the feeling that citizen action can only go so far, uh, that those leading higher up in governments need to lead the way. Um, identifying connecting with climate officials working on the topic internationally, interesting. Um, persuading people to have to make hard decisions, uh, something that's come up in uh, my society's prototyping work, um, people ex accepting short-term inconvenience or risk for long-term and often non-individual return. Uh, theory of change, too many projects haven't really thought about it or don't have a robust or well-evidenced one. Data availability, which you've heard about already today, uh, it's difficult to find reliable data for many areas. Uh, also, it can be very difficult to measure impact. Uh, apathy and the difficulty in reaching people. Um, people think they've heard it all before, don't believe this time will be any different. They also don't think that their small local changes can make enough of a difference. We've got, I suppose, a related point about citizen perceptions of the future, a disconnect between local discussions and the big changes that are coming, and the lack of, um, sort of futures techniques like games that might help us understand what that looks like. Um, the for-profit practices of social and mass media companies, which can lead to division and people paying money to try to sort of quash uh, a lot of the solutions that have been suggested. Uh, a lack of collaboration and coordination. Lots of people out there doing work, but um, there's often a lot of duplicated effort. And again, um, it might be easy to build a uh, technical solution, but publicizing it and getting people on board, that comms bit, uh, is often very difficult as well. Uh, we've also got um, change focus, uh, something from healthcare technology. Uh, the golden rule is to speak to the cold face uh, and listen carefully to their answers. And yeah, terminology. So again, people not understanding the words climate communication should be localized for people to understand and get involved in the fight. So lots of things uh, to think about there. Um, I'll go to each of our speakers for some quick reflections on all of that. And again, if you would like to come in, please do use the raise your hand tool uh, or say in the chat, uh, but I'll go to Rafa first for any, any reactions to all of that. Well, uh, I completely agree with most of these points, I think. I think uh, when working in the intersection between journalism and technology and civic technology in particular, it's quite challenging to measure the impact of the stories. So what happens next once we have our data journalism projects on climate change in Africa published by 10 media partners in the Congo Basin? Is that really affecting the behavior of the readers? Uh, probably, but it's very difficult to measure. Uh, so I think uh, that kind of challenge is super important. I think what's sometimes missing in the type of journalism projects I've been working on is the data use focus. So once we publish the stories and we open up databases and we, we make them more accessible, uh, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, key stakeholders use the data and the stories that we're publishing? They really put attention into it. It's very difficult to do that. I think uh, it's important to invest a little bit of the funds and a little bit of energy into data use, which is missing in uh, probably in the project I worked on, but also in many other projects I, uh, I could see around me. 
Um, so that's a very cool point. I'm gonna drop a like into that. And then also I absolutely agree with the duplication challenge. Um, I can see a lot of similar but different solutions. That's so true. Um, I don't know how to fix that, but I think there will be organizations that try to map out what's out there and try to connect the dots and let people join forces rather than uh, you know, waste energy with individual fragmented projects that have not much impact, but they would have much more impact if they joined forces. So very cool inputs from the audience, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And you've got just over an hour to think about how to solve all of those things as well, just to, to do something about it. Um, Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, a huge variety of such a huge variety of challenges there. And a lot of it, a lot of it rings true. And, and I can think of various examples in my career. I mean, one thing that I am sort of struck by is when we talk about civic tech, it's often very broad in scope. I, we're considering sort of all citizens as a sort of homogenous blob and they're all kind of saying a lot of the challenges come like sort of activating them and asking people to make sacrifices a, a very small minority will say yes I'm there you know I'm ready and the rest will say no I'm, I'm ambivalent and so I do wonder if uh, a way to think about negotiating these challenges is not to sort of butt up against things where there's no chance but to just slice down and to find the champions you know and that's the way that you can then have the the change or that's a better way to catalyze the change and there's that quote about small small group of determined people and, and so on but i wonder if that works in quite a lot of the domains that we're talking about because there's the data tribe and then there's the campaign tribe and there's the people who are really prepared to make deep sacrifices and you know there are groups that are really into or part of the solution to each of these challenges but when you look at everybody they're quite diluted um so that's my sort of one reflection from looking at the challenge Fantastic, thanks. And Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that really strikes me about sort of the list that we've come up with here is, um, first of all, like climate, climate is this long scale horizon thing, and it's easy for our leadership to displace it by more acute, urgent needs. Um, pandemic is like a great example. Um, just just like a, a real world example of that is like, we went from, you know, leaving behind single use plastic as a priority to suddenly the pandemic comes in and single use plastic is like the safer, safer way to, to handle the virus, right? So it's, it's really difficult to weigh the priorities of climate with all of the other things that, that people in, in political and leadership positions have to, um, have to weigh in their decision making when you're competing with all of these other things that are happening around the world. Um, and so I think, I think broadly speaking, that's a huge challenge here. Great, thank you. Um, Amanda in the chat, uh, following on from Lawrence's point, have you found any techniques that really help you identify or advocate directly to those champions? I've seen many organizations struggle to find or connect with those people among the masses. It's a really good question. Um, if anyone has an answer to that they'd like to venture, or again, any other reflections on what we've just been talking about, please do um, raise your hand uh, or use the chat. Uh, Louise. I don't have an answer, but I would uh, point up the work of climate outreach in this area. In, uh, I, I mean, I, I take Lawrence's point. I think in order to have a good chance of impact, you do need to be quite specific about what you're trying to do, who you're trying to reach, what, what change you're trying to make. And I think climate outreach have produced some very good guidance in terms of how people feel about climate that helps kind of uh, do that orientation in the early stages of a project. Who are you trying to reach? Is it people who are already converted but want stuff to do? Is it people who are skeptical for particular reasons? What's what's your kind of, um, your audience, which I think can be super helpful. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Um, and Lawrence, yeah. Yeah, so I'll come in again if I if I may Gavin I mean I I just think and following on what Laura said about the the plastics I mean I think it's it's do we do we put our attention on uh you know the 
the high emitters or the people who are sort of modeling uh, the actions that we want to see. And I think it's interesting thinking about veganism and or plant based, which is it's grown hugely in the last five years. And I think a lot of that has come from, uh, you know, celebrity people or, you know, very visible people saying, I'm going plant-based and it's now acceptable and normal. And I think it's interesting with single waste plastics, there is a movement around, you know, zero waste and some people have blogs and things, but I would say mostly that hasn't broken through in the same way. And the focus is very much on everyone who isn't doing that. It's, you know, everybody who's got loads of plastic. And so we're just, but we don't do that. We don't go and find the people who are eating all the burgers all the time and say, you know, you need to stop. And so I do wonder, I mean, they're highly speculative, but if we had more of a focus on modeling people who are, uh, you know, living the life of zero plastic or very low waste, maybe that would be a better way of engaging people. Great, thank you. Yes, culture means a lot faster than policy when it changes. Uh, Louise has just put in the chat. Uh, so excellent set of points there. Um, so let's move, let's move from the sort of what everyone's doing and the problems that we've encountered to starting to head towards some solutions uh, to these massive, massive challenges. Uh, so the next question uh, to our speaker, uh, to our speakers is what, if anything, have you done to try and address uh, some of the dilemmas and some of the challenges um, that we've already discussed? Again, I'll go to our speakers. I'll go to Lawrence, then Laura, then Jacopo. Then we'll have a bit of time uh, to add to the panel, and then we'll have some uh, time for the discussion and reflection. So, Lawrence, what, if anything, have you done to try to address uh, all of the things that we've talked about so far? Yeah, so I think one challenge we may have is, is narrowing our focus, because I think there's quite a lot of things in scope. But I can say uh, some things we've tried to do, I think, around making experts more available or visible and the um, Open Data Institute had a really nice project recently around data portals and how they fit in into like a service design to solve people's climate data problems on their journey. And it was much more expansive than making a technology platform. And they proposed an idea around having data guides who are basically these people with sort of expert domain knowledge who are specifically funded or resourced. A lot of the time, you know, the experts just do everything for free and you just you know, send them a message on Twitter and ask for some of their time and, and help, and which is fine. But they were sort of proposing, could we, and Subek's in a good place to do this, could we resource and grant and say to people, you know, could you devote a certain amount of your time just being in this guide signposting role where, you know, you have office hours or something like that. You allow people to drop in and you can then give them the benefit of your domain knowledge and, and expertise. Um, and that can just be so much faster. And again, I can think of projects I've worked on where, again, you know, I've spent a long time you know months researching something and trying it and then I have a conversation with someone who's particularly insightful and then I you know completely switch gear or switch approach um I think it, it really can't be understated how effective that sort of expert domain because again that's some, you know probably someone who's been working in that area for you know years and years and years and has all this knowledge so data guides is interesting distilling expert views and making them available that again is sort of for organizations but I do think there's a similar sort of principle, which is kind of, you know, what journalism and, and what sort of think tanks are meant to do to synthesize like these complex things and then present to everybody else. Um, I think the challenge then is to, to do that while ensuring that, that everyone's objectives are the same, because then you have a lot of different alignments. But yeah, short version da data guides could be an exciting way to do it. Brilliant. Thank you. That's definitely something for us all to think about. Um, Laura, how about you? How have you uh, tried to address some of the challenges uh, that you've faced and that we've discussed? Sure. I mean, I agree with the sentiment that these are some really, really big challenges that I don't think any one person or any one organization is going to be able to step in and, and um, be able to solve them unless someone comes up with a way to have infinite money and resources. Um, um, I see changes theory of the case is to focus on hyper local impacts um, to make sure that residents are um, communicated with directly on impacts on green investments that they can see the, the difference that they're making in their communities. Um, we're trying to make sure that local climate investment is is like more hyper local and more equitably distributed. Um, that residents have a directed voice to their government, a direct connection to help decide where to spend the money that is handed down from the federal government and on what, and then communicating when that investment is made. One example of this that we've done in Miami, that city has invested just tons and tons of money into climate resiliency infrastructure, again, because it's slowly falling into the sea. 
Um, so when a resident reports flooding, one thing that we're able to do on our platform is help um, help the city communicate like exactly where in those neighborhoods the money that is being invested is being spent and what it's being spent on and how it is going to help solve some of these flooding challenges that arise. Um, there's also a lot of really cool innovation happening in just the way that business models are approaching this challenge. Um, there's a company I really like in the United States called Clearloop that is using um, carbon offset models to help um, our utilities fund large scale uh, renewable energy uh, arrays. So, um, you know, all of these companies that have net zero targets or sustainable development goals can help direct some of that money into large scale community solar projects that help these low income communities that are highly dependent on coal or these dirty energy sources clean up clean up their energy grid. Um, and I, I really like the way that that is actually making a tangible difference to people in, in communities that have otherwise been overlooked. Um, I think the other thing is like overcoming this sort of apathy and, and making hard decisions challenge. Um, you know, I honestly, I feel like we're in kind of a new era with climate. And, and I say that as someone whose life has been dramatically impacted by um, by climate change, a tornado hit my neighborhood and wiped out the whole thing. It happened less than a week before COVID lockdowns. And I essentially was a climate refugee. I had to find a new place to live in a time that, you know, people were not being particularly welcoming to um, having other people around, right? Because, because the pandemic had everyone kind of scared way back at the beginning. Um, climate change is, is upon us and is increasingly going to cause problems. Um, I think arguably the pandemic is a climate impact. Um, not only that, there have been, there are an increasing number of severe weather events all around the world. Um, the time of, of climate impacts being far away and impacting other people, and so I myself can be apathetic about it, I think is increasingly over. Um, the, the truth of the matter is these issues, water scarcity, um, famine, the ability of crops to grow, like all sorts of these issues are going to be increasingly problematic for large portions of the population. And so I think as, as those impacts start to exponentially increase, apathy and the ability to make hard decisions is going to naturally decrease, right? Because, I mean, just like the severity of the things happening around us require the, a, a more severe response. Um, as to sort of the social media problem, um, man, I could wax poetic about this for a while. Um, I think what Europe is doing on data protection is the thing that needs to happen to keep social media networks in line. Um, you guys have the GDPR that's, that's helping to protect the way that your data is used. Um, that that in and of itself is holding these social media companies accountable in ways that they haven't before. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of, of having those types of regulations sort of worldwide, particularly in the United States. Um, I, think, I think that would go a long way towards helping make sure that social media is more um, lifting all of us up instead of tearing all of us down. Excellent, thanks. There were some really powerful examples and experiences there. Uh, thank you. Um, I can see in the chat as well, we've got some really interesting discussion going uh, from Andreas, Lawrence and Louise around that point about data guides. Uh, they also need reference data. So how, how do you get both the technical side and the human side um, of that sort of data experience right? And yes, Louise, I, I think we, we seem to have forgotten that there were people that did this uh, for a very long time called librarians that we may seem to have completely forgotten about. Um, Jacopo. Yeah, I would like to talk about uh, data humanization, because I think it's one of the points that uh, journalists can help fix. So how do you make sure that data is not just perceived as a very distant, remote, abstract resource, something that, you know, it's in a piece of paper or on a website, but doesn't really have any kind of re uh, relationship with our daily lives. So I think journalists can, or more specifically, data journalists, journalists who 
connect data sets with human stories can help fix that. So I can think of some of the stories we published as part of Lungs of the Earth that try to humanize the data around the forestation in, uh, in the Congo Basin. But I can also think of other global examples, like for example, the work made by Vox.com uh, in the US, uh, which is particularly good at kind of connecting videos with data. So they kind of create animated data visualizations into and kind of incorporate them into their reportage on video, which I think they're very effective and can help make data more accessible and more human. Um, so I invite everyone to check Vox.com on YouTube and uh, search some of their videos because they kind of, uh, they found a new way to visualize data into documentaries and they are usually quite short. So this also fixes the problem of attention span. So it's not like an, an endless video, but it's more like a 10 minutes sort of short documentary on, on uh, any key topic they, they believe they should cover. And they made some really good ones on climate change and environmental security around the world. Uh, they made a series called Vox Borders, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, it's not about environmental issues, but it's about borders uh, or critical borders between countries. Uh, and the author, who's an American guy called Johnny Harris, is one of the top experts in these kind of animated data visualizations. And he made some tutorials online on how to replicate that. So I think uh, animating uh, data is a, a way to make it more accessible, especially in the age of TikTok and Instagram, where people expect videos. So I think we should try to break into that world and not be uh, snobbish as kind of old fashioned journalists who don't want to use TikTok. I think we should find a way to use the platforms that are used by, by the people uh, and do it in a clever way. So how can we make TikTok a source of robust and useful information? How do we visualize data on climate change on TikTok? And how do we relate it to kind of daily problems? Uh, I think that's where we are kind of aiming towards at the moment as Code for Africa. We're trying to experiment with these new formats and approaches. Uh, I see some people uh, are dropping comments on the chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll share some links to the resources that I'm mentioning. Uh, I'll do that on the chat and on the uh, board online. So yeah. And uh, in, before, before my, you know, in the previous round, I mentioned WhatsApp as a channel to share asynchronous climate change, but also non-climate change related learning material. Uh, I think we should again move into the platforms that are used by the people instead of you know, trying to push more traditional channels. Uh, like top-down lectures. I think we should try to exploit WhatsApp uh, to build communities. And this is particularly useful in, uh, in uh, some African regions I've been working into. And I'm sure it's useful in probably all over the world these days. Yeah, I'll drop the links now. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you. And thank you to Laura as well for putting some links uh, in around all of that. Yeah, find, find where the people are, uh, I suppose, is the lesson there. So um, we're going to give you three minutes again for, for silent working. Um, this time it is about uh, what, if anything, you've done to try and address uh, some of the dilemmas and challenges that we've been talking about. It's the third column of the Padlet. And you've got three minutes and then we'll, we'll go back to reflection and discussion again. So what, if anything, have you done to try and address the dilemmas and challenges that we've discussed? Uh, add to uh, column three of the Padlet. Great. So the sorts of things that people have said are around what, if anything, have you done to try and address the above dilemmas? We've got collaborations. Uh, so across country, we've got uh, a particular example uh, from Germany about working with local environmental protection departments. Uh, we've got our data guides or our data librarians. Uh, we've got hyper-local online environmental info webinars. Um, invited local experts who communities may be familiar with 
um, to talk about uh, e-bikes, community bikes if you're the local cycling club, um, and then have an open session where people could interact, share and learn. It's a really interesting approach. Uh, what have you done? Everything we can think of, uh, says somebody. We're using a digital tool and blended approach uh, to try and reach the communities um, we're working with. Um, so again, multiple places, just trying to trying to get to where people are. And um, what, if anything, have you tried? Have you done to try and address the dilemmas? Not enough. Uh, for most people who are working voluntarily in their spare time in civic tech, there aren't enough hours in the day, both to develop a solution and promote it effectively. Uh, Winning elections uh, is something that somebody else has put in. Uh, Green, the Green Party here in the UK, have gone from two to 20 uh, elected councillors in Oxfordshire in the last four years, for example. It's got lots of excellent ideas there. And again, a few more links going in the chat um, as well. Um, Lawrence, let's go to you first. Any, any reflections on uh, everything else that people have put? Well, I, I really like what Titus is comment, which I think he or someone else has just just added it around this road shows that, that you have a you have one product or you have one thing or collection of people that's really, you know, tight and well organized and clear. And then you and then you take it to all the places and then you have a sort of best of both. You have the consistency and you have the sort of alignment around the message and you have something that is well thought out and you have a sort of centralization if you're going to collect you know emails or details or coordinate but then you also have the local experience and you have you know a voice people can then engage and, and share and like come together in the community so and I do wonder if that is something that is under like I don't my experience is that isn't that doesn't happen that much and so I do quite I do quite like that idea um yeah winning elections as well is great I mean again I think it's very I think a lot of civil society feels um, also, you know, sort of disempowers itself in a sense and says, you know, will that stay in the civic bucket? You know, politics is there and we're here and we'll stay in our lane. But it's like, yeah, the great thing is that you can go and get elected and actually get involved. And maybe we should be encouraging people to do more of that, to do more, you know, to stand as candidates. Um, and certainly, you know, I definitely very much support the, the Green Party in terms of highlighting climate issues. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Laura? Any reflections on all of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like the focus sort of universally in this list on keeping hyper local impacts. Um, I, I, I strongly believe that local politics is where people have the most sway. Um, and, you know, you kind of start from the bottom and, and trickle it up. Um, now there's, you know, a whole discussion about how power works. Um, but I think connecting with people in their communities is is a really effective way to, to get a handle on this problem. Fantastic, thanks. And uh, yeah. Uh, well, I completely agree with the idea uh, that we need sort of bridge uh, people like the data guides or the data librarians I think that uh, from my perspective, having somebody who connects um, scientists with journalists and journalists with people, and as a consequence of that, then scientists with people is absolutely fundamental to tackle climate change and especially to fight uh, disinformation and misinformation around climate change. This is not just in Africa, but I think also in Europe. So how do we facilitate the connection between data and then also the scientists behind the data, those who know how to interpret the data and the people? How do we kind of create a bridge between them? Something that I think civic technologists and civic organizations can help do. And uh, I think it's a very important tool to uh, combat disinformation around uh, climate change and climate de uh, denialism, that's another way to put it. People who deny climate change, there are a lot of them. And they get viral on social media. So we kind of, we're in the middle of an information war um, and climate change is one of the topics that kind of is affected by this information war. Yeah, so we need to be aware of that. Yeah, I agree with you, not to derail the conversation, but I, I think, you see all of these misinformation campaigns around the world. I think the, um, the people who have built them got their sea legs on climate denialism in the, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s. And 
uh, you see a lot of similar tactics between the climate denial movement and, and misinformation campaigns all around the world. So I agree that's a huge problem. Excellent, thank you. Um, does anyone else uh, on the call have any views on any of that? Again, do feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand tool or uh, jump in in the chat as well if you've got any thoughts about any of that. And I see Susan's put some contact details in the chat as well around uh, the environmental info webinars. So do get in touch with her if you're interested in that. Lawrence. Um, I think so. someone made a comment about like open source and open code as a way of reducing duplication. And I do think to go back to what we said before about how do you connect the hyperlocal to the large scale ask. And I do think as much maybe one way to do that is when groups do this work, they do think about it, doing it in a way that is open and scalable or, you know, that they're making a template. So everything they do, they then publish and sort of tidy up and say, right, now the next person can do this or the next borough or the next council or whatever it may be. But there's some idea that it's, it could be for the benefit of beyond, you know, just, just that group. And I think there's lots of tools and handbooks about how to create these kinds of resources that are more accessible, that, you know, are slightly better documented with the idea that it isn't that much harder but that then you're sort of setting yourself up for, in the best case, you demonstrate a really impactful local intervention. And then, you know, the rest of the country says, oh, wow, you know, this has worked over here. Maybe this can be, you know, rolled out in a much bigger uh, level. Louise. Yeah, I just I guess following on from that idea, Laura, I'd be interested to hear, you've got a very kind of tangible project that's working in America, have you had people interested in picking up that approach or, or literally picking up the technology and trying it elsewhere? Do you have views on how easy or hard that would be? Yeah, we would love to talk to anyone who has any interest in, in deploying. We're trying to turn uh, what, we've, what we've done in these cities into a turnkey solution that scales to other places. Um, and we're, we're pretty close to that. So I think, um, We'd love to have a discussion with anybody around the world on how we can help. Fantastic. Um, Lawrence, do you want to come back in? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, there's actually, we're actually supporting someone who is doing, trying to do an open data project around, uh, called Helen Jackson, who's around trying to use like local news sources um, to, uh, as like a way of a way of bringing visibility to all sorts of flooding impact that otherwise is very very poorly reported and so trying to find like technical ways to sort of scrape local news apis and things and like maybe even twitter and things in the future where everyone does talk about these things but they don't necessarily make their way up into like an environment agency or government data set which is which is i think you know has a huge sort of overlap laura with with the kind of work you're doing but but very like techno and it's just this one researcher but i think that would be a really interesting link up Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for the, the really um, brilliant discussion so far, as we've considered what people are up to, uh, some of the challenges uh, that you've all faced and some of the solutions that you've, you've, you've tried to come up with. We're now going to move even further into that sort of solution uh, space, which is um, thinking really practically about what we might be able to commission. So the Action Lab or working group that comes together after this civic tech surgery, and again, full details on how to apply to be part of that uh, at the end of this meeting. Um, the Action Lab or working group will have up to 3,760 US dollars. Uh, we'll be able to commission a project, there'll be a call for proposals, um, and that will be designed to help solve one or some of the problems that we've highlighted today. So in the remaining time that we've got left, we are going to address the question, what sort of things might help to address the common challenges that we've discussed so far? And we've heard some really interesting ideas already, actually. And um, what we're going to do is to start with five minutes this time of silent working uh, on the Padlet. So this is the fourth column. Um, you can also, of course, use the Zoom chat as well. Um, so think of practical ideas that we might be able to commission that help sort, solve some of these problems. Fourth column of the Padlet board, use the chat and once we've had those five minutes and um, again I'll come back to our uh, discussions but also and um, there'll be an opportunity for everybody on the call to, to share what you think about it as well so five minutes what could we commission what are the practical solutions to what we've been discussing excellent so I'll have a look I'll read through what we've got on the padlet then I'll come back to our discussants so 
Laura, then Jacopo, then Lawrence for any reflections. And again, if uh, you want to come in on anything, please do use the chat or do use the raise hand tool. So let's go to the Padlet. Um, we have, so results have a good model for mobilizing people to take action on an issue, which might be worth developing for climate. So that's results.org. Um, we could create, publish, and publicize a model example of responding to a council's climate action plan. We could commission a series of infographics on effective climate language for persuasion, which would build on the work of climate outreach that we heard about earlier. Um, this could be reused by journalists and storytellers around the world, especially if social media, uh, if it was social media friendly and potentially viral. Um, finding sustainable long-term support for data librarian and storytelling data journalists, which may not be within scope or budget. A project to recruit, train, and support community climate champions based in research teams, policy units, universities, etc., would be really useful. The seed funding for an agency to pilot could be what we commission. Um, could support climate change data journalism, um, micro grants in underreported regions, some seed funding specifically to enable reuse of an approach, technology, or data set. Communications between climate champions and citizens. How can local authorities that have declared climate emergencies engage with their citizens so there is mutual understanding? That might involve a combination of engagement so software using public consultation with local data and uh, sort of psychology used by climate action by climate outreach. And um, yes, there's quite a quite a spread of uh, possible solutions. There, I think we've heard a few others during the course of today as well. Uh, let's go to our panel uh, for their responses first. So, um, so Laura, what's, uh, what's your reflection on those possible solutions that we might commission? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a lot of really great ideas. Um, I've, been, I've been chewing on this question a bit um, on, you know, how do you, how do you take these smaller level grants and make the money go the longest or the furthest? Um, one thing that I really, really love is working with college students. Um, Gen Z is probably really annoying for people to manage, but I, I love them. Um, they're so passionate about this issue specifically, and they come at it from this really unique perspective that hasn't been warped by um, decades of inaction and decades of, of like all of these things that, that have been happening in, in climate communications. And um, I think one thing that I would do with a grant this size would be to go out and find college students that are studying like really niche climate solutions, like climate communications or some of these other more niche problems and helping fund their research um, or funding them to do work for private organizations um, helps a little bit of money go a long way. Um, personally, I would love to see more research done on like how communication science can overcome climate denialism, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, um, or even, even, um, like a, like a contest where you have college students competing for grant money, um, based on ideas to solve a particular challenge. I think those are really effective ways to spend a little bit of money too. Um, another thing that I have found to be relatively effective in the United States is um, uh, we have a lot of protests that happen and um, they're not always climate related, although oftentimes they are. Um, with just a couple hundred bucks, we've, uh, I have a team that started setting up just a table and everyone that goes to the protest, we ask them to write a letter to their representative and then come Monday morning, we mail it. Um, so that um, we're sort of bridging the gap between people who are in the streets and, and feeling passionate about an issue and actually taking that passion and, and having something tangible to send to a representative. Um, so that's, that's been a really interesting thing that we've been doing too that, that can be done for like not a terribly expensive amount of money. Um, so yeah, I mean, those, those are, I think are the two ways that I would go about it. Fantastic. Thank you. Plenty for us to add to the list there. And I think um, you've identified one of, the, one of the real challenges, which is how can you make uh, a, a small grant go as far as possible? So definitely something we're thinking about. Um, Jacopo. Um, I think some of the solutions that are being proposed here touch on data journalism as a potential way to you know, raise awareness in an effective way around climate change. 
And uh, for example, there are at least three solutions that could be combined together. Uh, the infographics one, um, the data journalism uh, micro grants one, and also the one about um, kind of uh, communication between climate champions and citizens. So I think these three could be combined together and uh, the grant could be used to create a package of infographics or social media cards or social media stories, I would say, I would suggest, that are checked and kind of based on the uh, climate champions uh, ideas and data so that this could be used to fight um, climate change disinformation, for example, in a visual and accessible way. Uh, I would love to see one of these grants dedicated to this kind of purpose using uh, these techniques that are being proposed. I think it might be very interesting to see what happens. Um, I think if we do that, uh, we should also come up with a with a strategy to make sure that these um, social media stories or social media cards or infographics uh, will target uh, specific audiences. For example, we could decide to do that with young people, uh, could be college students, for example, or others in specific areas, and then get their feedback as well. Thank you. And uh, just on a point that both of you and Laura raised uh, around research into climate comms and myths and disinformation myths, but a really useful uh, link into the chat, uh, which gives a bit more information on all of that. Uh, Lawrence, uh, what are your reflections on the uh, suggested possible commissions? Yeah, I think there's some, there's some really nice ideas in there, though, though some of them I think could definitely need a lot longer term and like larger resource. This is something I've been reflecting on because we have these individual grants and um i think it it really is worth it right at the beginning just saying is this kind of thing that we're funding someone to do is it going to to really succeed is it going to need long-term maintenance and is it going to need long-term support or is it just a one-off or is it an exploration um and if it's long-term support then you know is there going to be any because if there isn't it probably isn't the right the right way to spend the money and the right thing for the person because they're going to do the project and they're going to leave and do something else um but i do think it in terms of like generating content or generating experiments, like having some sort of like, I, I like that several sessions have lent on climate outreach to lean on, you know, already existing well-researched bodies of work that explain or, you know, suggest ways of communication and then say, okay, well, maybe we can test the delivery of those messages. Like we're, we're leaning on some stuff. We know what to say, but maybe we should do some experiments on, you know, what medium we put this through or yeah, maybe through TikTok or social media or something else. And then it's like a little experiment, right? And it's sort of short. It's very clear what the aim is and what we're trying to achieve. Ideally, there's some sort of measurable outcome. And then you publish it and say, you know, we did this very discrete project and these were the outcomes. I like it with the micro journalism as well, because I do think with this kind of grant, you are kind of looking for a, a good, where can the money have the most impact? Um, and I think, you know, there's plenty of projects where, you know, this, this grant would, you know, just go into a, a massive pot and basically have no marginal impact. And so it's, yeah, can we find people, maybe students who, again, you know, uh, who we can give, a, who a small grant, I would call this a small grant, can have a big impact. And I think we found that with some of our fellowship grants where people said, you know, wow, this is like, I've really been able to devote a serious amount of time to this that I wouldn't have otherwise. And it's not, the, it's kind of rare to have those kinds of money grants. I mean, a lot of fellowships and opportunities, there's no money attached to at all. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't take it for granted at all. But um, I think, yeah, being very conscious of the scope, I think is really important. Fantastic, thank you. So does anyone else joining us uh, today have any views on what we've heard? Uh, any solutions that have suddenly come to mind that we haven't discussed uh, or any, any perspectives on how, what, what we should be commissioning and uh, how we should be thinking about commissioning as uh, Lawrence was saying as well. Again, do use the raise hand tool, which will be at the bottom of your screen, um, or use the chat uh, as well. Any further reflections on what we should be thinking about commissioning to address some of the challenges that we've discussed? Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, the one, one classic way, of course, to make the money go further is to do 
uh, hack days or inducement prizes, uh, you know, and it, it, that is, it needs a load of effort. Someone has to go and administer that and run it and market it. But the idea is that you then gather in a whole load of people um, and then they all compete for, for ideas. And so, you know, instead of getting one little project, you end up with 10 small. And the thing with hack days and those kinds of things are, you know, you're not going to build something substantial. But again, if it's just about ideas and experimentation, could be a way to, to get more for the. Thanks. It's a sort of pretty concept, isn't it? Uh, seeing what you might be able to do. Anyone else got anything, any thoughts that they want to share on any of that? In which case, um, I don't know if any of our speakers have any final thoughts on uh, the entire thing that they want to share. Um, otherwise, I will tell you what happens next. Excellent. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen again. Thank you for all of your hard work today, um, sharing what you've already been working on, sharing the challenges that you've faced and what you've tried to do with them. And then of course, thinking about what we might be able to commission, which is what happens next. Um, we will be convening an action lab, uh, a working group of around six people um, at some point after today's surgery. Uh, they will all work together to commission uh, something, put out a call for proposals, which will help address one of the common challenges that we've been talking about today. Anyone can apply to join that action lab. Uh, details will go out first by the Tech Tech uh, mailing list, which you're probably on since you're here uh, today. But um, if you're not, please do sign up for it. Um, again, we'll put a link in the chat uh, so you can sign up to the Tech Tech mailing list. Uh, you'll hear when applications are open. Um, and yeah, if you get onto the action lab, uh, you'll have a meeting where we think about what exactly we will commission. And then at some point uh, in the next few months, there will be a call for proposals uh, that goes out uh, on the My Society website. Uh, there will be up to $3,760 uh, to do that work. And um, yeah, we'll be taking applications. Uh, the Action Lab and our steering group uh, will take a look at uh, those various applications and uh, somebody will get to do the work, which will hopefully um, be a small first step towards solving some of the things that uh, we are um, that we've been discussing today. As you can see from the links that Rachel's put in the chat, you can sign up for that newsletter. We will be publishing a recording uh, and minutes from uh, all of this as well, so you can revisit and uh, think further. Uh, and we mentioned that other event in September at the beginning uh, today, uh, which is uh, sort of a showcase of people doing interesting things with data and digital technology around fighting climate change locally. Do take a look at that link. Uh, and do uh, get in touch with us if you might be interested in showing off what you've been doing. Uh, we'd also really love feedback on this session and uh, there will be an email link to all of that as well. So unless anyone has anything else uh, that has come to mind, uh, all that remains for me to say is a very big thank you to um, all of our fantastic uh, speakers who helped uh, stir up such a brilliant discussion today. To all of you for joining us. Uh, to my society and uh, the National Endowment for Democracy uh, for supporting uh, all of this work. And um, yeah, we've also got that sixth uh, civic tech surgery coming up in September on civic tech and hostile environments. Keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for all of the course proposals that will be going out and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>